Access your free language gifts right now, before they expire. First, the Talking About Interest Cheat Sheet. With this cheat sheet, you'll be able to talk about your hobbies, how often you do them, and much more. Second, 10 phrases you need for introducing yourself. If you're new to the language and can't yet introduce yourself, then this one-minute lesson is for you. Third, how to say hello like a native speaker. This quick lesson will teach you 15 unique ways to say hello and greet others. Fourth, most common ways to say goodbye. What about saying bye? Do you know all the ways to say bye in your target language? This one minute lesson will get them stuck in your head, guaranteed. Fifth, the how are you and how to answer it writing workbook. With this printable PDF workbook, you'll learn all the ways to ask and answer the question, how are you? And you'll be able to practice writing the phrases out as well. And finally, our big collection of language learning audiobooks for anyone who's watched this far. If you visit the link below, we'll send you over to our library of language learning audiobooks, which you can get for free. Save them to your device and listen and learn. They're yours to keep forever. To get your gifts and language learning resources, click the link in the description below. Download them right now before they expire. Hi everybody, welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. Let's get to your first question this week. First question this week comes from Bodan. Hi Bodan, I hope I said your name correctly. Bodan says, hi Alicia, you've been teaching me for the last half year. Cool. I want to ask you about the contraction of the word would with nouns. Sometimes I hear that we can use catted instead of cat would or lessened instead of lesson would, but I can't find any information about this. Can you explain it to me? Sure, yeah, absolutely. So we can contract would to just apostrophe D. So for example, when we have an expression like I would like, we can contract this to I'd like, right? As you suggest in your question, we can also use this with other nouns. So for example, you talked about cat would, and that's perfectly okay. So the cat would love that treat, or the lesson would be over by now. We can also use these contracted forms with other nouns. It's totally fine to do this. So the answer is yes, you can use I would or noun would as a contraction, just using apostrophe D. That's totally fine to do. It's very natural actually to do this. So just keep in mind that although it's very natural and very common to use noun plus would as noun apostrophe D, there's another apostrophe D to be careful of when you're reading and when you're speaking. And that's when had is used in the reduced form. We see this in patterns like subject had been. So for example, I had been or she had been. In these cases, had is reduced to apostrophe D, just as we talked about earlier with would. This sounds like I'd been or she'd been. So a very common question is how do I know the difference between the reduced forms? How do I know if it's I would or I had? And the answer is to look at the word that comes after the contraction. When we use the noun would pattern, the word that comes after this is a verb in the infinitive form. So for example, I'd go, or she'd sit, and so on. The verb is in the infinitive form, so that means the base form. There's no change to the verb there. On the other hand, when we use this had in the reduced form, the verb that follows it is a verb in the past participle form. So for example, I had been, or she had eaten, and so on. So the verb that follows the contraction is what's telling you the hint. It's what's telling you which form of apostrophe D you're looking at. This may take a little bit of time to get used to, especially in speech, but that's okay. This will become more natural as you practice. So a good way to do this is to keep an eye out for this contraction when you are reading. So I hope this helps you understand how to use this apostrophe D for would and for had. Thanks very much for an interesting question. Let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Hassan. Hi Hassan. Hassan says, what is the difference between stationary with an A and stationary with an E? Thank you. Okay, yeah, great, really interesting question. Stationary with an A and stationary with an E. Let's talk about stationary with an E first. Stationary with an E refers to things like paper, pens, ink, envelopes, and so on that we use to create kind of nice letters, or maybe we use them for like official documents or something kind of formal. So generally when we write someone a note or maybe we're at home just taking some kind of information down on the phone, we just use 
just plain old paper and pens, right? But another way to understand this is as stationary, the things that we use to write our letters, to write our notes, and so on. When we use the word stationary, we can use it to talk about kind of like office supplies sometimes, but a lot of the time stationary refers to kind of nice things that we use for letters and for other situations. So for example, you might hear about matching stationary. That refers to paper and envelopes that come as kind of a set. There's like a special design on the envelope that matches the special design of the paper. So when the person receives the letter, in this case, it looks very formal, it looks beautifully designed. So we often think of this when we think about stationery. So maybe you use this very special pen to write something in a beautiful way and so on. So this is stationery with an E. This refers to these kinds of materials and tools that we use for generally kind of formal or maybe special occasion uh, communication. On the other hand, stationary with an A refers to something that is not moving. So for example, if you're in a car, it's stopped in traffic, you can say, I'm stationary right now. <laughs> so that means you are not moving in any direction. Something that is in the state of not moving is stationary. Simply, stationary with an A refers to something that is not moving. So your car, when stopped, is stationary. Or maybe when you are walking through an airport and you need to stop for a moment, you are stationary. So that means that you are not moving. Something is in the condition of being stopped. So we call this stationary. So these are two very, very different terms for sure. So be aware that when you're talking about writing and those kinds of materials, we use stationary with an E. When you're talking about the condition of being stopped, we use stationary with an A. I hope this answers your question. Thanks very much for sending it along. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question is from Rohit Soni. Hi, Rohit. Rohit says, what's the correct pronunciation of the? Should we say it like uh, or like e, the or the. Ah, the answer is both, actually. So generally, when we're just talking in everyday speech, we don't want to put any special emphasis on the noun that comes after this word. We just say the, the. So for example, I went to the movie theater, or I saw that on the computer today. When we're not trying to kind of indicate some special emphasis, we use the, generally. The is used when we want to indicate some kind of special emphasis for something. So maybe you're trying to make a decision between a couple of different things, for example, and maybe you think to yourself, ah, oh, this is the choice for me. Like you want to emphasize something about that item or something about your decision, you might use the instead of the to do that. So both pronunciations are 100% correct and they're both totally natural to use, but if you use the the pronunciation all the time, it's going to sound really weird. I'm using the the pronunciation in these cases because I'm trying to emphasize the in this case. I'm trying to emphasize the difference between the two pronunciations. So if you're having kind of a hard time trying to think about this, like, oh my gosh, how do I know when to emphasize a word? How do I know when I shouldn't emphasize a word? What does this even sound like? Maybe an exercise that you can try is just to go back and watch this video or watch any other episode of Ask Alicia and try to listen for the times when I use the and the times when I use the. Chances are that when I use the the pronunciation as I just did, I'm trying to emphasize or kind of highlight the word that follows my the pronunciation. When I use the, I'm probably just kind of continuing along in speech. There's no special emphasis there. So if you want to kind of look for an easy way to practice, you can just use these videos and try to find out like, hmm, is she using the here or the there and why? Probably it's for emphasis or to help that next word stand out a little bit from the other information. So to answer your question, both pronunciations are totally correct. We just use them in slightly different ways to kind of show a little bit more emphasis here and there. So thanks very much for sending this question along. All right, that is everything that I have for this week. Hi everybody, welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. Let's get to your first question this week. First question this week comes from OK Sinon. Hi OK, I hope I said your name right. OK says, award and reward have similar meanings. What is the difference? Thank you. Great question. Award and reward. These two words can be used as both nouns and verbs. So let's break them down one by one. 
First, let's talk about reward. Let's talk about this as a noun. A reward is something we get in return for doing something else. So for example, if you help your friend move into a new apartment, they might give you a reward. For example, they might buy you pizza, or they might buy you something, or give you some money even, perhaps, in exchange for helping them. We can understand this as a reward. Or for example, if you see somebody posting like a missing sign, like maybe someone's cat is missing, it might say on that poster where they're talking about the details of their missing cat, reward $100. So this means in exchange for finding my missing cat, I will give you this money. So we're talking about some kind of exchange of services or maybe some kind of exchange of goods, I suppose, in some cases. But generally, when we do something for someone else, they might hopefully <laughs> give us a reward in exchange for that thing. We can use the verb form of reward in the same way. So for example, I found my neighbor's cat and he rewarded me with $100. Or I helped my friend move into her new apartment and she rewarded me with pizza and beer. It was a great time. So we use reward to talk about these kinds of transactions, right? These kinds of doing good things in exchange for getting something else. So whether or not you do the good thing just for the reward is a different conversation, but this is what reward means. Let's compare this then to the word award. So let's talk about this as a noun to begin with. An award is not something that we get in exchange for something. It's not something that's related to a transaction. Rather, an award is usually given to somebody else as kind of a recognition that they've done something really great. So there's some kind of excellent quality about this person. So for example, a top scientist might receive an award for his or her work. Or maybe at your workplace, you might receive an award for excellent performance that month. So the key with award is that there isn't really some kind of transaction. It's rather some kind of recognition of a great job done. You might also be familiar with awards shows, especially in the entertainment industry. So actors and actresses often receive awards for their performances. They're receiving some kind of trophy or some some other kind of maybe certificate that shows that other people think they're great. So that's what an award essentially is. So for example, the actress was awarded an Oscar for her performance in the movie. So an Oscar is a very, very high level award for actors and actresses. Or for example, I was awarded employee of the month at my job this month. So we can use award as a verb or as a noun. So the key difference here between award and reward is that award is used in situations where we're recognizing something great about someone else. Reward is used in situations where we're kind of talking about some kind of transaction. Someone does something in exchange for something else. So I hope this helps you understand the difference between these two words. Thanks very much for an interesting question. Okay, let's move along to your next question. Next question comes from Ginny. Hi, Ginny. Ginny says, hi, Alicia. Can you explain the word superglued? I heard it from a conversation. Okay, sure, yeah. Superglued as a verb, right? Past tense verb in this case. So first, let's talk about superglue as a noun. What is superglue? So if you don't know the word glue, glue is a sticky material, a sticky substance that we use to attach things to other things. So for example, if you're doing like a craft project, you maybe will use use glue to maybe put one piece of paper onto another and it stays there, right? It becomes hard and stays. So this is glue. Basic glue is used by kids in schools to do arts and crafts projects. Super glue then is like the next level of glue. So super glue is used to attach much tougher materials together. So maybe wood, for example, or some kinds of fabric maybe. So when we use super glue, we can use this as a verb actually. So although it's a noun, super glue, which refers to just like a mega type of glue, we can also use this as a verb. So to super glue something means to use super glue to attach something to something else. So in your question, the word super glued means I used super glue to attach something to something else. So this is what super glue means as a noun, and it's also what it means as a verb. So some other example sentences might be, I super glued the two pieces of fabric together. I don't think they're going to come apart. 
or she super glued her fingers together. Oh no, what should we do? So super glue is sometimes used in kind of unsafe ways, but this is a actually kind of common example sentence that you may hear, especially when kids are just finding out about super glue for the first time. So I hope this helps you understand the use of super glue as a verb. Thanks very much for an interesting question. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Lisa says, hello, I have a small question. Can you give me a definition of overwhelming and some examples? Thank you. Okay, yeah, great question. Let's talk about how to use overwhelming because this might be a little bit difficult to understand. At the base, at its core, overwhelming means that something is too much emotionally. So when we have an experience and we feel really, really strong emotions, we can describe that as something that is overwhelming. We can use this in positive situations and in negative situations. Something that causes you to feel a lot of happiness could also be overwhelming. Like you feel so much happiness that you feel maybe you need to cry or something. That could be described as something that is overwhelming. On the other hand, when you have something negative happen in your life, like something very, very stressful or very difficult, you could also describe that as overwhelming. So you feel such strong emotions relating to stress or sadness, for example, that you want to cry, maybe. We can describe that as overwhelming as well. So let's take a look at some example sentences so you can see how it might be used. First, let's look at a happy example sentence. You could say, my wedding day was so beautiful. It was overwhelming. I cried. So this is an example of a situation that is very happy and that causes lots of emotion. So it's like it's too much emotion at one moment and you feel kind of like oh, a little bit out of control perhaps. This is something we can describe as overwhelming in a positive way. On the other hand, a stressful situation might be something like, my boss made me work so much overtime last month. It was overwhelming. So this expresses that someone is feeling stressed or upset about a situation that was emotionally just too much for them. So we can use overwhelming to talk about these different kinds of situations. Also, here we're focusing on the word overwhelming. So we use this to describe the situation outside us. So my wedding was so beautiful, it was overwhelming. Or my job was overwhelming last month. So we're talking about the thing outside us. When you want to describe your own emotions though, use overwhelmed. So we can use this in the same kinds of situations. We just need to change the grammatical structure of the sentence a little bit. So for example, in a happy situation, we might say something like, my wedding was so beautiful, I was overwhelmed. Or we might also say something like, I was overwhelmed with happiness. Some people like to include the emotion at the end there. So overwhelmed is the expression that we use to talk about our own feelings. I was overwhelmed or I am overwhelmed. Again, in a stressful situation, we can do the same thing with this word. So my work was really, really difficult last month. I had to work so much overtime. I was overwhelmed. So again, we're talking about having too much to do, too much to take care of, feeling a little bit out of control. There's just too much of a certain emotion. So when you talk about your own emotions, use overwhelmed. When you talk about the thing outside you, use overwhelming. So I hope this helps you understand the use and the meaning of the word overwhelming and overwhelmed too. Thanks very much for an interesting question. All right, that is everything that I have for this week. Thank you as always for sending your super great questions. Hi everybody, welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them, maybe. Let's get to your first question this week. First question this week comes from Kavisha Samarasin. I hope I said your name right. Hi Kavisha. Kavisha says, what are the differences between do and does and is and are? Can you teach me? Yeah, sure. So let's start by looking at do and does. We use do and does as part of a question that we're asking, and we decide to use do or does according to the subject. So when we use the subject you, for example, we use do, like do you, something, something, something. And when our subject is he, she, or it, we use does. Does he, does she, does it? We can, of course, use other subjects with do as well. Do I, or do they, or do we? But for today's lesson, let's use you because it's a very easy example to use. So we can ask yes or no questions by putting do and does at the beginning of this question. For example, do you have a pen? Or does he have my wallet? 
we can ask these simple yes or no questions. We can also use do and does in information questions that begin with a WH question, like who, what, where, when, and so on. For example, what do you do means what is your job, or what does he do means what is his job. So we use do and does as part of these different kinds of questions. So we have these simple yes, no questions where do and does come at the beginning of the question, and we have these information questions where these words come in the middle of the question. So the key here, though, is to remember that we use do with certain subjects, I, you, we, they, and we use does with other subjects, he, she, and it. So this is a quick introduction. I hope that that helps you understand the differences between do and does. So let's talk a little bit now about the differences between is and are. The key here is to remember that is is used with singular subjects and are is used with plural subjects. So to give a very, very basic example, he is something something and we are something something. So in the he is something something example pattern, we have a singular subject, he is, that's one person. In the we are pattern, we have we as the subject, which represents more than one person, so a plural subject, right? So we can expand this, we can use this in other ways too. So for example, two dogs are at the park, that's another way to make the subject plural. Or we could say one dog is at the park to make the subject singular. So the key here is that is is used for singular subjects and are is used for plural subjects. Also keep in mind that these are used in present tense situations. If you want to make these past tense, we would use these as was and were. So I hope that this quick introduction helps you understand the differences between do and does and is and are. Thanks very much for the question. Okay, great, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Matthew. Hi, Matthew. Matthew says, hi, Alicia, I'm from Peru and I'm 17 years old. I always watch your videos, thank you. My question is, how can I improve my listening and how long does it take? I'm very good at grammar and other things, but sometimes I worry when I don't understand conversations. Yeah, sure, let's talk about some ways that you can improve your listening skills. So I know that a lot of people, of course, want to listen to something to improve their listening skills, but like you said, it's sometimes really hard to catch all the words. If you're watching maybe a movie or like a YouTube video or something, sometimes you have subtitles, right? You have captions at the bottom of the screen so you can read what's being said and that's really helpful, right? But what do you do if you're listening to like a podcast, for example, or maybe a news report? Those are kind of difficult situations because there's no captions, right? So what do you do? The thing that I recommend a lot for listening practice is to find materials that have a script. So sometimes you can find podcasts or other language learning materials that also have a script. So it's not just listening, but you have the option to listen and to read along. So this is really, really helpful for exactly the reason that you mentioned in your question. If you can't quite catch a word, or maybe there's a new expression or something like that, or maybe the way that the person speaks is kind of unique or something you haven't heard before, you can check the script and see what that person said. Like what were the words that person used? And you can think about how that person, how that speaker connected words in a certain way. So you might be listening to something that has a kind of special dialect maybe, or they speak very, very uniquely, or maybe they have kind of a funny way of speaking, whatever that might be. If you have a script, you can check the script and that will tell you what the other person actually said and you can kind of think about that, like, hmm, maybe it's different from the way you've heard that word pronounced in the past or maybe that's a totally new word that you need to go and look up. So this can be a really great way to work on improving your ability to catch those new sounds and to hear how people link sounds together. So that would be one tip, is to choose materials that have a script or if you watch videos with captions, that's also great too. But make sure that you have something that you can read so you can check your understanding. That's tip one. My other tip for improving your listening skills would be to listen multiple times reading and not reading the script. So that means, for example, you listen three times, let's say. So the first time you listen with no script, 
You just listen and try to see, hmm, what can I understand? The second time, you listen and you read at the same time. And the third time, you listen with no script again to see how much you've improved. So another tip with this kind of listening practice is to try to space out your listening sessions over many days. So of course, if you want to and if you have time, you can listen multiple times on the same day. But the point is to improve your listening skills over time, right? It's not just to improve your listening skills for one day. So if you listen, for example, to the same lesson three times in a week and you have a script to refer to, you can refresh your mind on the script a couple times throughout the week, you're probably going to see improvements in your listening skills over time. It'll probably be a lot better than if you just listen one time and try to cram everything in in one listening session. So this can be another way to improve your long-term listening skills and it will also help you to remember any new vocabulary that you find in your listening and your script reading exercises. So those would be my two big tips tips for working on your listening skills, to choose materials that have scripts that you can check and refer to, and to space out your listening practice over time, and to make sure you practice with and without the script so you retain and remember those new words. So I hope that this helps you and good luck as you develop your listening skills. Also, you mentioned in your question, how long does it take? Please keep in mind that this is always an ongoing process. We are always developing our listening skills and always developing our ability to recognize new words, even in our native language. So just work on what's in front of you and try to set some small goals that you know that you can achieve for yourself that will hopefully help you to keep your motivation up. So thanks very much for your question. All right, let's move on to the next question. Next question comes from Chitra Yum. Hi, Chitra. Chitra says, hi, Alicia. The word people and the word persons, which one is correct for the plural form? Can you answer this? Yeah, great question. Okay, so generally speaking, in most cases, you will use the word one person for a single person and two or more people for multiple people. This is probably going to be the case in the vast majority of situations. So that means in very, very close to all situations. There are a few situations where you may see someone in writing, probably, using persons to mean the plural of person. And there may be some situations where you see people people with an S. So we can talk quickly about these, but these are kind of rare situations. So the key guide that I want you to remember is one person, two or more people. That's the one that you can use in most situations. But let's talk about these other kind of rare situations. In very legal or formal or perhaps official writing, like in rules and contracts and these kinds of things, you may see sometimes persons being used instead of people, like two persons or three persons, something like that. You may see this choice used in those kinds of situations. We generally don't use this in everyday communication and everyday conversation. So this is kind of this rare or uncommon use of persons. Next, let's talk about the use of peoples, so people with an S. This use is typically used specifically when we're talking about different ethnic or racial groups. So for example, if we're talking about maybe a tribe of native people, we might use peoples to talk about multiple tribes in one region. So for example, if a news article is talking about tribe A, tribe B, and tribe C in the article, they might say the peoples of the region. That use of peoples refers to three different different tribal or ethnic groups. So this is a very, very specific use of this peoples. This is pretty much the only time that we use this S at the end of the word. So you may see this from time to time when talking about specific racial groups or specific ethnic groups or specific tribal groups. But again, in most situations, you can follow the rule of singular one person or multiple, two or more people. So I hope this clarifies any doubts that you have about the uses of these words. Thanks very much for sending along your question.
All right, that is everything that I have for this week. Thank you, as always, for sending your great questions. Remember, you can send them to me at EnglishClass101.com slash ask hyphen Alicia. Also, there is a link in the YouTube description. Please send me your questions there. Don't send them to me in a YouTube comment or in a Facebook comment or whatever. There's too many questions, so make sure to send them to the official question submission page. Also, if you like this lesson, please, please, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Also, check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Hi everybody, welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. Let's get to your first question for this week. First question comes from Shahram. Hi Shahram. Shahram says, what's the difference between career and job? Okay, uh, so basically a career is a series of jobs or multiple jobs that happen over your whole life. So your career is like your job history. As you can maybe guess from this explanation so far, a job is one position that you have. So when you work for a company, for example, you have a job inside that company. Maybe then if you change jobs inside that company many times, you have a career working for that company, right? Or if you decide to change jobs many different times with many different companies in many different roles, you have a career in many different companies. So this is basically the difference between the two things. A job is a role, one specific role, your specific responsibilities and tasks in that position, and your career is like your job history or your work history. Okay, let's take a look at how we use these words with some example sentences. First, let's take a look at how we can use the word career. He's had a long, fulfilling career in the electricity industry. And she wants to work on building some technical skills for her career in computer programming. Next, let's take a look at some example sentences that use the word job. I'm looking for a new job. Have you heard of any positions at your company? And I really like my job right now. It has good benefits and really good compensation. So I hope this helps you understand the differences between career and job. Remember, your job is a single position, the tasks and responsibilities you have at one time. You can have multiple jobs at one time. And your career is your job or your work history. So thanks very much for sending this question along. OK, let's move on to the next question. Next question comes from Dashrath. Hi, Dashrath. Dashrath says, which English is easier to learn, American or British? Ooh, interesting question. Well, first, we can't say that one is easier than the other. They are both forms of English, and it's also really important to keep in mind that inside American English and British English, there are many different dialects or many different ways of speaking the language. So yes, we have some types of English that are considered kind of the standard for American and British English, but there are also many, many different ways of speaking English in many different countries. So there's also Australian English and Irish English and Scottish English. There's so many different ways of speaking the English language, it's really hard to say this one is easier to learn or that one is easier to learn. Instead, maybe think about the kinds of resources that you have available. And by that I mean, for example, your media resources and the textbook resources that you have. If you watch a lot of media in British English, for example, then maybe that one is going to feel easier for you because you like watching that media. You're exposed to that kind of speaking more than you are American English. If that's what works for you, then maybe British English is better for you. On the other hand, if, for example, you live in the USA, then it's probably going to be a lot easier for you to study American English than it is to study British English because everyone around you is going to speak a form of American English in most cases. So think about the kinds of resources that you have around you. Think about the media that you have, maybe a teacher that you have. Does that teacher speak British English or American English? Do you watch YouTube videos in American English or British English or some other type of English? So think about kind of your own situation and think about what your goals are as well and maybe that can help you to make a decision between American English, British English, or something else. As I said before, there are many, many different accents and many different dialects in the English language. So don't expect that you're going to be able to understand all types of English just by studying one of them. Keep in mind that even native speakers of all of these dialects still run across interesting new words or interesting new ways of speaking. And sometimes we even hear a person talk and think, 
I can't understand what that person just said because the accent is so different from our own. So please keep this in mind when you're trying to think about which one is easier. It's not that one has easier grammar rules or one has easier spelling or anything like that, but it's more important to consider which one is going to maybe be easier for you to pick up, which one is going to be more appropriate for you to spend your time on. So maybe consider that and try not to think so much about like which one has easier rules or something like that. So I hope that this answer helps you and I hope that you're able to decide which one is best for you. So thanks very much for sending this interesting question along. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Serioza. Hi Serioza, I hope I said your name correctly. Serioza says, hi Alicia, what's the difference between disgust and loathing? Thank you in advance. Sure, let's talk about the differences between these words. First, let's talk about disgust. So disgust is a noun, and we also have the adjective disgusting. So we use these words when we're talking about something that is gross, or something that we feel like, ooh, I don't wanna see that, or I don't wanna touch that, or I don't wanna eat that. Something that feels kind of creepy, or maybe something that feels a little bit like, ooh, that's dangerous in like a kind of a gross way. So we use this in in a couple of different situations a lot. First is when we're watching movies that have lots of violence and maybe they have lots of blood and guts, those kinds of films where you can see everything really clearly. We use the word disgusting to talk about that kind of thing. Those kind of images we can describe as disgusting. Like in a very violent movie scene, we might say that the scene was disgusting because there's lots of blood or we can see body parts or something like that. So it causes us to feel kind of like, ooh, I don't want to see that, or that's kind of shocking or scary in some way. We can express that feeling with disgusting as an adjective or disgust. So for example, that scene in the movie was disgusting. Or you might say, I reacted to that scene with disgust, to use the other part of speech of this word. So we can use this when we're talking about visuals, so something that we see and we have that reaction to. Another very common way that we use this is to talk about food and drinks and things that we don't want to eat or things that don't look nice. So for example, if someone brings out something they cooked and it looks really bad, like something that is not going to taste good or maybe it looks like it's not fresh, you can describe that as disgusting, like, ugh, that food looks disgusting, what happened to it? Or you can also use disgust, the other part of speech, in the same manner too. Like, ugh, we couldn't hide our disgust at this meal. So this shows that something is unappetizing. It's something that you don't want to eat. So again, the common point between these two uses is that we kind of back away from that thing. We think that it's not good, it's not attractive, it's not good for us. There's kind of that emotional response to something, like, ugh, that's not good for me. Okay, so let's compare this to the word loathing, the other word that you mentioned in your question. Loathing is the noun form, and we also commonly use this as a verb, to loathe. When we say we loathe something, or we look at something with loathing, it refers to extreme dislike, like hatred. So for example, someone who has done something to you in the past that was so terrible, that you can't forgive them, you never want to talk to them again. You might describe your feelings for that person as loathing, or you might say, I loathe that person. Or for example, you might see something terrible happen in the news, some violent act. You might describe that, or people might describe that by saying, wow, we loathe that act of violence, or we loathe the person who did that thing. So that means a strong, strong dislike. It's like something that's rooted deep inside you. It's like a very strong hatred. But kind of the difference between just hatred and you know to hate someone or to hate something. Loathe is less about having like that high level of anger that we think of with hatred when we say I hate that or I hate this. When we say I hate that or I hate this, it often has kind of a feeling of like some kind of high level of anger or we have high emotions running at that time. When we say we loathe something, there's less of that feeling of the high level of emotion and kind of something more deep inside us, something that's kind of at our core, at the very, very middle of our, of our body maybe, that makes us say, I dislike that thing very much. So to loathe something, that's a very strong word, but so we use that in cases where the situation is very, very serious or someone has done something that we simply cannot forgive. So to recap quickly, disgust and disgusting and the other parts of speech associated 
associated with this word, we use these to talk about things that make us feel kind of grossed out, things that are yucky, things that don't look good to us. And we use loathing or to loathe in other parts of speech to talk about things that we have a very strong, deep, intense dislike of. So I hope this answers your question. Thanks very much for sending it along. All right, that is everything that I have for this week's lesson. Thanks very much for sending your awesome questions along. Don't forget, if you want to send your questions to me, you can send them at EnglishClass101.com slash ask hyphen Alicia. There's also a link for this in the YouTube description, so please don't forget to send them to the official question submission page. Don't put them in YouTube comments or somewhere else on the internet because I probably won't see it. There are too many. So make sure to send them to the official question submission page, please. Also, if you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Also, check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. It's me shaking. It's a dance. It's, the shake is a dance. What's a dance? A dance. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Know Your Verbs. My name is Alicia, and in this episode, we're going to talk about the verb shake. Let's get started. The basic definition of the verb shake is to move up and down in quick, short movements. Some examples. Shake the ingredients together in a bag. She confidently shook his hand. So now let's take a look at the conjugations for this verb. Present, shake, shakes. Past, shook. Past participle, shaken. Progressive, shaking. So now let's talk about some additional meanings for the verb shake. The first additional meaning is to move around because of physical or emotional disturbance. Some examples. The buildings shook in the earthquake. His voice shook as he told the sad story. In these example sentences, uh, we see that there's some kind of disturbance that's happening. Uh, so in the first one, it's a physical disturbance. So the buildings shook in the earthquake. There was some physical disturbance and the buildings shook. So the, meaning the buildings moved like side to side or maybe up and down. So this motion uh, we refer to as shaking uh, because of some kind of disturbance. In the second example sentence though, it's someone's voice. So a person's voice shook. His voice shook when he told the sad story. So in this case, it's not like physical motion, but it's like the voice sounds unsteady. So um, this is related to an emotional disturbance. So it's a sad story. He feels emotional, so his voice is shaking. It's like you're, you're struggling not to cry or you're struggling to hold back emotions. Like you can hear a person's voice change um, when they're trying to hold in uh, to not release kind of strong emotions. So we refer to that as like a shaky voice uh, to use the adjective form. Um, but we can also use a verb, uh, shook in this case, past tense. His voice shook when he told the sad story. The second additional meaning for the verb shake is to get away from something or to become free from something. Some examples. I can't shake the feeling I'm being watched. She finally shook her habit of snacking. So in these example sentences, we see that shake is being used to refer to getting free of something, to shake something. So in the first example sentence, we see a common expression, I can't shake the feeling. So I can't shake the feeling means I can't get free. I can't escape from this feeling that I have. In this case, I can't shake the feeling I'm being watched. That means I feel always like someone is watching me. So probably not a good feeling. I can't shake the feeling. Or like I can't shake the feeling that this was the wrong thing to do. So some kind of feeling you can't escape from. We could say I can't shake the feeling. In the second example sentence, we see shake used to talk about a bad habit. So the example is she finally shook her habit of snacking, or we could say her bad habit of snacking. So to shake a habit means to escape from or to be free from a bad habit, some negative thing that you don't want to do anymore. You might have heard this uh, meaning applied in that song from Taylor Swift where she says, shake it off. Uh, she repeats the expression, shake it off, where shake it 
off is like negativity. Shake it off there means just let it go, like break free from it, escape from that negative feeling. So to shake something off is just to let it go, shake it off. So imagine like it's like dust on your body and you just make a shaking motion and it comes off, you're like you're free, you're escaping from that negativity. That's the kind of image that she's trying to um, suggest in that song, to shake it off. The next additional meaning for the verb shake is to upset someone. So to upset means like to cause their emotional stability to be disturbed. So this can mean to cause someone to be angry or to be sad, to be disappointed. Um, usually angry or sad though. Let's take a look at some examples. The awful story really shook me. He was shaken by the sudden changes at work. So in both of these example sentences, shake is being used to refer to a feeling of like unhappiness, of anger, of sadness, some kind of change from regular emotional stability. In the first example sentence, the awful story really shook me. It means like that story was so awful that it affected me, it upset me emotionally. So like I felt really sad or I felt really angry or maybe unhappy in some way. So to feel shook by a story is like something really affected you, or like strongly affected you. So you feel quite upset. It's not just like a common, oh, I feel sad or something. It's more like a strong kind of deeper feeling. Whoa, that shook me. Uh, in the second, what was the second one? He was shake, shaken by the sudden changes at work. Okay. In the second example sentence, he was shaken by the sudden changes at work. It means sudden changes at his job caused him to feel very upset. So all these new things happened and he felt like really surprised or really unhappy or really stressed out. So they upset him from his regular like emotional stability. He was shaken, he was shaken. So we can use that uh, to refer to a strong emotional disturbance. The fourth additional meaning is to decrease stability, to decrease stability. This is slightly different from the third meaning, which was to upset someone. This one is specifically about decreasing stability. So it can mean in like some kind of um, belief um, or it can mean in an organization. Let's look at some examples. The bad news shook her confidence. This is a scandal that could shake the entire government. So in the first example sentence, uh, the bad news shook her confidence. So here it's not just her, but what is being upset? What is decreasing in stability here? Her confidence. So maybe the other parts of her personality are fine, but confidence is affected in this case. So the bad news shook, the bad news decreased the stability of her confidence. So in other words, her confidence kind of decreased. She didn't feel so confident after hearing the bad news. In the second example sentence, the scandal could shake the government. It means this scandal is probably so big that it could decrease the stability in the government. So that means something really terrible happened. And because of that, the government's like regular functions or the government's regular ways of doing things um, might not continue. So it's decreased stability. That's the nuance of this use of shake. One more small point about this one is that this is sometimes used with up. So like in the second example sentence, uh, this scandal could shake up the entire government. Like to shake up something is like to kind of change a known idea. Like we thought we knew everything before, but this new information has shaken everything up, has shaken up the government. Like, oh, it's caused some changes. So like we lost some stability. This could be a good thing though, like to shake up a scientific field, for example, like maybe some new discovery shakes up a scientific field. But in that moment of like discovery or like in my second example of like a scandal, in that moment, maybe stability decreases, but it could, it could lead to something positive in the future. So you really have to pay attention to the situation to understand, is this a positive thing or a negative thing? The first variation is to shake one's head. To shake one's head is this motion. It's this 
It's this side-to-side -side motion that means you disapprove. It means no, <laughs> generally. Uh, so let's look at some examples of this. He shook his head when I asked if he was okay. Don't shake your head at me. So to shake your head just means to say no. Like you don't have to say anything. You can use this motion to mean no or to show just disapproval, to show like rejection of something. So in the first example sentence, he shook his head when I asked if he was okay, means he did not say anything, but he shook his head. He made this motion meaning no. I asked, are you okay? And his response was this meaning no. So we use that to talk about that action. In the second example sentence, it's a command. So don't shake your head at me. Maybe a mother would say this to her child or a father might say this to his child, like a child shaking their head like this, like, I don't want to do that or rejecting something their parent said. Uh, the parent might say, don't shake your head at me. So meaning don't say no to me. So the next variation, I put these two together because they're very similar. They are to shake loose or to shake something out. So these expressions mean to use a shaking motion to remove something. So to shake loose or to shake something out. Let's look at some examples. She shook her bag loose from the hook. Shake the dirt out of the rug. So in the first example sentence, she shook her bag loose from the hook. It's like uh, her bag is attached to a hook. So a hook is like this sort of thing. You hang your bag here. If the bag is stuck, maybe, or there's some problem, or I don't know, you can't reach it easily. Um, in this case, she shook her bag, meaning she made this shaking motion to remove her bag from the hook. So she shook her bag loose. We use loose to talk about that. But you can use this expression if there's some, like, I don't know, I don't know, maybe you go to buy candy from a vending machine and it gets stuck when you buy the thing. So you might shake it, you might shake your candy loose from the vending machine in that case too. So to shake something loose means to um, get something out of like a jammed situation. In the second example sentence though, we see shake out. So uh, the second example sentence was shake the dirt out of the rug. It means again, make a shaking motion to remove dirt from a rug. So means do this and get the dirt or whatever else is in the rug out. So remove the dirt from the rug by shaking it. So it's to shake something out of something else. Okay, so those are hopefully a few new ways for you to use the verb shake. I hope that you found something new. Uh, if you have any questions or comments or would like to try to make an example sentence, please feel free to do so in the comment section of this video. Hi everybody, welcome back to Know Your Verbs. My name is Alicia and in this episode, we're going to talk about the verb air. Let's get started. Let's begin with a basic definition of the verb air. The basic definition is to broadcast on radio or TV. Some examples. When is this episode going to air? This radio show airs every week. Now let's take a look at the conjugations for each verb. Present, air, airs. Past, aired. Past participle, aired. Progressive, airing. So now let's talk about some additional meanings for this verb. The first additional meaning of the verb air is to express opinions. This is often though um, complaints or problems. Some examples. They aired their grievances at the meeting. Please air any issues with this policy at the next conference. So in these example sentences, we see air used to talk about expressing something, expressing an opinion, but as I said, this is typically some kind of problem. There's an issue. There's um, something that people want to complain about. So when we air a grievance, as in the first example sentence, it means express a complaint, really, or say a complaint, make a complaint. But to air a grievance sounds quite formal. So a grievance is like something you are grieving. In other words, something that makes you unhappy. Uh, but it's a noun, a grievance. So to air a grievance means to express a complaint, to talk about a problem that you have. In the second example sentence, uh, where the expression air any issues you have with the policy, 
It means, again, to complain about a policy or to share your opinions about this policy,、uh, to share any maybe problems you have about the policy. So to air means to express an opinion. The second additional meaning is to expose to air for ventilation. We often use out with this meaning. Let's take a look at some examples. He aired his laundry outside. We're airing out the bedding today. So, in the first example sentence, he aired his laundry outside. We see that he is exposing his clothes, probably, to air outside somewhere. So that means like hanging up clothes so that air can flow through them. Air is a noun here. That means that the、um, like breeze or sunlight or whatever makes the clothes feel fresh. Hopefully. So to air laundry refers to letting laundry be exposed to like sunlight to the outdoors. In the second example sentence, we're airing out the bedding today. It means the same thing. It means our bedding. So bedding refers to like sheets or like covers or pillowcases, for example. To air out bedding means to expose that to sunlight, to air, to the breeze, so that it becomes more fresh. So to air out、um, is sometimes used, or we might just see air to air something as well. It means to expose it to fresh air, to expose it to the sun as well. This is definitely a short episode, but I think it's important to keep in mind that air, actually as a verb, has some very interesting and quite different meanings. So keep an eye out for it the next time you see it used as a verb in a sentence. I hope that you found something new. Uh, anyway, if you have any questions or comments about this verb, please feel free to let us know in the comment section of this video. This is my wish. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I'm so good at gestures. <laughs> Hi, everybody! Welcome back to Know Your Verbs. My name is Alicia, and in this episode, we're going to talk about the verb fish. Let's get started. The basic definition of the verb fish is to try to catch fish. Some examples: He fishes at the lake every summer. We're fishing for something fresh for dinner. Now let's look at the conjugations for this verb. Present: fish, fishes. Past: fished. Past participle: fished. Progressive: fishing. So now let's take a look at some additional meanings for this verb. The first additional meaning is to try to get something without being straightforward. Let's look at some examples of this. Watch out! I think he's fishing for confidential information. Do you think she's fishing for an invitation to the event?、Uh, so these example sentences show some kind of behavior that's like not clear. So. In the first example sentence, we see he's fishing for confidential information, meaning he's trying to get confidential information, but he's not asking directly. He's not being straightforward in trying to get that information. He's fishing. It means like he's going around the issue to try to get it. So this kind of fishing behavior tends to be kind of suspicious. Uh, especially in this example sentence situation, we also see this in the second situation.、Uh, she's fishing for an invitation to the event. It means again, she wants an invitation to the event, but she will not directly say, "Please invite me." Instead, she's trying to go around the situation or trying to be kind of passive or not being very clear about what she really wants. You will also hear this in a very common expression: fishing for compliments. To fish for a compliment means you're like saying something with the expectation you will receive a compliment in return. So, like for example, a common one is like maybe complaining about something you're wearing, like "Oh, this is so old," or "Oh, this is so ugly," or you know, "Oh, I'm not sure about my hair," something like that. With the expectation that someone else will give you a compliment, so that's a very common behavior, I think, for some people.、Um, so we use fishing for compliments to describe that. So you're you're using not a straightforward way to get someone to say something nice about you. I was thinking about it in terms of like moving like a fish, like you're not straightforward. You're just kind of 
moving around the issue, never going direct sort of thing. But yeah, the idea that like, oh, you're kind of putting out some idea, like you're going fishing for a concept or going fishing for a like an invitation or some information. You're putting something out as like bait and you hope the other person takes the bait and gives you what you want. So it's like you catch the information or you catch an invitation, you catch a compliment. Ah, interesting, for sure. That's way better than mine. That's way better than my interpretation. So anyway, fishing for something is going after something, but not in like a clear way. You're trying to like get it through slightly suspicious means, perhaps. Let's move on to the second additional meaning for this verb, which is to grope around for something unseen. So to grope like you're looking for something is like this motion. You're looking for something, but something unseen means you can't see it. So we'll look at some examples here. He fished for his keys in his bag. She's fishing in her purse for a pen. So in these situations, we're putting a hand in our bag or in a purse and we're looking for something, but we can't see inside the bag. So maybe we're talking to someone else and we're looking for something. So we can use fish to talk about that. So fishing around in your bag, you might also hear around used. It means you're searching for something, kind of like fishing. You can't see what you're looking for, but you're just hoping that you'll find it based on sense of touch. So in the first example sentence, uh, he fished around for his keys in his bag, perhaps a common one. In the second example sentence, she's fishing for a pen. So there's some specific object we hope to find, um, but we talk about this motion with fish instead of like looking. We can say fishing to kind of give that nuance of searching for something, but we can't see what we're searching for. All right, let's look at this variation of the verb fish. It is to fish out. To fish out means to pull something out in a manner similar to fishing. So in fishing, when we catch a fish, we might make this motion, like this pulling or drawing motion in order to get the thing we caught. So when we say fish out, it means like we're making the same motion. Let's look at some examples. I fished a cup out from behind the refrigerator. She's trying to fish her cat out of the closet with a treat. So in these example sentences, it refers to this kind of pulling motion to get something or to retrieve something. In the first example sentence, it's a cup behind the refrigerator. So in this situation, a cup fell behind the refrigerator. To retrieve it, maybe, we need to use some kind of like pulling motion to get it out. So. Or maybe we have to get some kitchen utensils, tongs. That's what I use when I have to fish something out. So we kind of pull or draw something with this motion um, and we can use the word fish out to describe that kind of retrieval. In the second example sentence, she's fishing her cat out of the closet. It's like she's giving the cat a treat, like she's trying to catch her cat sort of by giving the cat a treat, maybe like at the end of a string, perhaps even. And she's making a pulling motion, trying to convince the cat to come out of the closet. So we can say she's fishing. <laughs> she's fishing for her cat, essentially, or she's fishing her cat out of the closet. So when you hear fish out, it means making this kind of pulling or drawing motion to retrieve something. Okay. So I hope that you found a new way of using the verb fish. If you have any questions or comments or want to try making an example sentence, please feel free to do so in the comment section of this video. What's the last word that you learned in your target language? Do you remember? If not, it's probably because you haven't tried learning recently. And we get it. Learning a language can be tough when you have to stop everything else, make time for language, find a resource, and then learn. You have to do a lot of work, even before you actually start learning. But what if you got new words sent to you every day so that all you had to do was learn and not worry about how to learn or what resources to use? You'd learn a lot faster, boost your vocabulary, and understand much more of the language. How to get new words sent to you every day. So in this quick guide, you'll discover why you should learn the lazy way if you want to succeed, how to effortlessly boost your vocabulary in under a minute a day, and how to get free bonus resources on a weekly and monthly basis.
But first, if you don't yet have access to our language learning system, sign up for a free lifetime account right now. Just click the link in the description to get your free lifetime account. And by lazy, we mean with a resource that guides you from lesson one to two to three, or feeds you new words so that you don't have to waste time figuring out what to do. Why do this? Well, learning a language already requires effort, right? But if you also have to worry about how to learn and what to do, you'll quickly get overwhelmed and discouraged. The point is, the less you have to think about, the better. So give yourself less to worry about and learn with a system that feeds you vocabulary, phrases, and grammar so that you can just focus on improving. Now, how can you do this? If you want to boost your vocabulary, sign up for our free Word of the Day lessons. All new users get this when they sign up for our learning system. The way it works is this free feature sends you new words every day directly to your inbox. It comes to you. You don't have to go chasing for it. All you have to do is check your email, check the meaning of the word, and you're done. All of this takes a minute or less and boosts your vocabulary every day. So even on your busiest days, when you don't have much time, you can still pick up a quick word effortlessly. If you want extra resources, we send free vocabulary lists, phrase lists, and PDF workbooks almost every week. And you also get our free gifts of the month every month, which includes our newest PDF cheat sheets, so you can master even more words and phrases and understand more of your target language. Again, you don't have to worry about chasing down resources. If you're a member, all of this gets sent directly to your email inbox so that you can boost your vocabulary without much effort. So if you want to get access to these learning tools and our learning system, sign up for a free lifetime account right now. Just click the link in the description to get your free lifetime account. What's the last word that you learned in your target language? Do you remember? If not, it's probably because you haven't tried learning recently. And we get it. Learning a language can be tough when you have to stop everything else, make time for language, find a resource, and then learn. You have to do a lot of work, even before you actually start learning. But what if you got new words sent to you every day so that all you had to do was learn and not worry about how to learn or what resources to use? You'd learn a lot faster, boost your vocabulary, and understand much more of the language. How to get new words sent to you every day. So in this quick guide, you'll discover why you should learn the lazy way if you want to succeed, how to effortlessly boost your vocabulary in under a minute a day, and how to get free bonus resources on a weekly and monthly basis. But first, if you don't yet have access to our language learning system, sign up for a free lifetime account right now. Just click the link in the description to get your free lifetime account. And by lazy, we mean with a resource that guides you from lesson one to two to three, or feeds you new words so that you don't have to waste time figuring out what to do. Why do this? Well, learning a language already requires effort, right? But if you also have to worry about how to learn and what to do, you'll quickly get overwhelmed and discouraged. The point is, the less you have to think about, the better. So give yourself less to worry about and learn with a system that feeds you vocabulary, phrases, and grammar so that you can just focus on improving. Now, how can you do this? If you want to boost your vocabulary, sign up for our free Word of the Day lessons. All new users get this when they sign up for our learning system. The way it works is this free feature sends you new words every day directly to your inbox. It comes to you. You don't have to go chasing for it. All you have to do is check your email, check the meaning of the word, and you're done. All of this takes a minute or less and boosts your vocabulary every day. So even on your busiest days, when you don't have much time, you can still pick up a quick word effortlessly. If you want extra resources, we send free vocabulary lists, phrase lists, and PDF workbooks almost every week. And you also get our free gifts of the month every month, 
which includes our newest PDF cheat sheets, so you can master even more words and phrases and understand more of your target language. Again, you don't have to worry about chasing down resources. If you're a member, all of this gets sent directly to your email inbox so that you can boost your vocabulary without much effort. So if you want to get access to these learning tools and our learning system, sign up for a free lifetime account right now. Just click the link in the description to get your free lifetime account. Remember, here's what you can do to learn all of these words by heart. Drill these words with our spaced repetition flashcards, which will help cement these words into your long-term memory. Save them to the Word Bank, your personal vocabulary collection where you can print out your own study sheets, or review the words with our looped vocabulary slideshow and play it until you know all of the words. So click the link in the description right now and sign up for your free lifetime account to get these lessons and study tools. Great work. Here's a reward. Speed up your language learning with our PDF lessons. Get all of our best PDF cheat sheets and ebooks for free. Just click the link in the description.